Good morning, all in grace to you. May the Father, his love rest upon you. Um, as I continue sharing what I feel the Lord is talking to me to share with you about, and it's again as being the portal uh, for us to carry his presence into this world at this time. And I think this is a very significant time in the history of mankind where I see lots of outpourings and the youth really being touched and put on fire in a new and exciting way. And we as the older generation, and I presume there's some younger generations here with us, <laughs> not all included, <laughs> my age, but uh, we have the experience and the wisdom to help channel guide and uh, Today's teaching, as I'm continuing with the portal of the mind, the Lord just uh, impressed on me to share a little bit about how do we minister? Because this is what our job is. We are going to go out and minister. This in a, a Tuesday is an equipping place where we, we have the tools. How do we minister to those uh, struggling with the portal of the mind? So I'm just going to bring up my PowerPoint right now. And here we go. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And I just put that at being a gatekeeper again. So be the keeper of the gates. The mind portal, helping skills for ministry. So when we look at the mind, the mind is incredible powerful and the more I've, I've meditated on this the more I've become aware this area of our mind is the real challenge so ask yourself a question and think of your answer who or what, or what do you think is the biggest obstacle people face as Christians today so just think for a moment. Write down your answers if you want to. What do you think is the biggest obstacle people face as Christians today? And I'm going to ask you, is it spiritual forces? Or is it other people? Or is it the chaos of the world system? Or is it the Christian's own internal thoughts? So you got a couple there. So what is the biggest obstacle? So Joyce Meyer wrote a book called The Battlefield of the Mind. And as I just Reflecting with Margie, Margie said, the mind is not the problem. And I agree with her. The mind is not the problem. What is the problem then in the battlefield of the mind? It is the conflict of the entrenched internal thoughts against the truth of the Bible that takes place in the area of the conscious, unconscious, and subconscious minds. That where is what I believe is the biggest battle today. And I mean, I think it's a battle with all of us. Do we really believe that the Father is able to supply all our needs? And we just have to have an empty bank balance for that to be revealed. Do we really believe the truth? We can say we can, but it's when we come into that place of crunch, those crunch moments, what 
is going on within our thought life. The battle against, oh, I haven't got enough. And the truth, he shall supply all my needs. As I've studied the scriptures, I have not found any accounts where Jesus healed people with anxiety, fear, or negative thoughts of self or others. It's quite interesting that. And if, if, if you can find a, a scripture for me or a place in the Bible where we see Jesus healed somebody's thought processes, I'd be very interested. We know he's cast out demons. He's known his restored physical uh, problems that people have. We know he has, um, what was the other one that just came into my mind? Um, I can't think of it at the moment. But, you know, we, we, we can see what he's done when it's physical, spiritual. But when it comes to fear, anxiety, negative thoughts of self or others, hmm. And these I would describe as what we call mental health. It is written, Jesus, oh yes, was the word was diseases. So if you get COVID, that's a pathogenic uh, virus, Jesus can heal that. Jesus forgave, I, I put the word Jesus in, that's my italics there. Who forgives all your sins, who heals all your diseases. And I had a look at that, and that's at our Psalm 103, verse 3. The Hebrew word for, uh, for diseases is chala, meaning to suffer, be sick, be diseased. And um, when we look at uh, mental health problems, and the world is very much, talks a lot about our mental health problems, this is a short list of what they term as mental health problems. And within each one of these lists, there are a number of other categories. So there's anxiety, dissociative, mood, trauma and stressor-related disorders, neurodevelopmental disorders, sleep-wake disorders, neurocognitive disorders, substance-related and addictive disorders. And all of these are related very much to the way we think. The question needs to be asked, when you, where I'm ministering to people with mental health problems, how do we go about it? Because as we can see, there might be another couple of factors that we need to take into cognizance. So when we lay hands and the Holy Spirit comes upon them, we should expect to see relief. Without a doubt. And it's because they are experiencing God who is perfect with all his love. We should see in that moment people with mental health problems. See, wow, I feel better. I feel lighter. But is that relief sustained over a period of time? Or does the previous condition return? And my observation of people over the years that I've been involved in church and in ministry, I've seen these conditions return, even though they've experienced an overwhelming uh, presence of the Holy Spirit. And, we, and I don't know if you've noticed this. We often can observe that those types of people are in the prayer line time and time again. If you've been to 
the regular church and there's always a, a prayer ministry line, you find that certain people are always there. And I always interested why, why why is they why aren't they not achieving what they want and it's usually for the same reason jesus answer to that is simple this is what i like jesus because he makes it so simple and he says have faith in god constantly not just for a temporary moment so Faith, as we were speaking in our session last time, uh, what we think is what we believe leads to our faith. Now, we experience God. You're in his presence. We, as you are overwhelmed, you will have faith in his ability. But we have to have faith in God constantly. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, in God's unlimited power. It's not that we're doing it. It's God's power that does it. But believes that what he says is going to take place, it will be done for him in accordance with God's will. And I like the amplified version here from Mark 11, verses 22-23. It's not us deciding, it's God's will and us fulfilling. We are that portal, that channel. The answer is that they need to believe, but the problem is the unbelief in the mind. The battlefield of the scripts and the thoughts and the experiences versus the truth. This is where the battle is. So how do we help people with the unbelief? Just t telling people to believe is for the most part useless. And I know that many people have been hurt by well-meaning advice. Oh, just believe, just have faith. And sadly, I've seen people being criticized when a condition returns. The key here is to help the person identify the source of the unbelief. That's the first point that I would say. What is the source of the unbelief? And, you know, last time we looked at it, there's ancestral iniquity, there's scripts, there's experiences, there's a whole lot of things. But what is the source? Where the incorrect understanding was first formed in the mind. And it's important for them to identify this. And this is where you might have a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom as you're operating in the gifts of the spirit. Once that is in, identified, they need to confess their unbelief. And there, oh, that's there is it's supposed to be T-H-E-I-R there, hopelessness to change. You see, a lot of people think, oh, I can change. No, we actually need the help of the Holy Spirit to change. We have to make the choice. We need to call on the Holy Spirit to help us to change. And if you try to do it in, this, in your own strength, if people try to do it in their own strength, it does not work, unfortunately. They then need to ask the Holy Spirit to help them to change. And this is where we go to coach them as you're ministering to them. You've got to coach them through this to help them with their unbelief. Psalm 139, 23, 24 says, search me thoroughly, i.e. where is the root? Oh God, and know my heart, test me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there is any wicked or hurtful way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So we always have to go to the source. Too many times I think we minister to the fruit and not to the root. Often when people are stuck and seem unable to make any meaningful progress, it would be helpful to help them examine if they have any unforgiveness or resentment. We always need to come back to the, the 
core principle of the new covenant, forgiveness. And because we have been forgiven, we need to walk in forgiveness. We need to let go of resentment. Explore if they are judging people. People are very hurt, especially within the church. Um, people get very hurt. They, they, they are very, uh, yeah, unresolved um, issues with uh, fellow believers in other churches. Um, Margie and I were listening to Joshua Mills uh, on a Sunday. And he talked about a fallout that he had with um, Pastor Bill of uh, Bethel. And it was many years later, and they couldn't even realize, he couldn't even remember why they had a fallout. But the Holy Spirit came upon him, and, and he realized he had to resolve that fallout. And people can get stuck if they are stuck in this unforgiveness and resentment, no matter how long ago. We need to have that pure heart. We need to help them have the pure heart. It's very, very easy to judge. And this is what Matthew 7, 1 and 2 says. Do not judge and criticize and condemn others unfairly with an attitude of self-righteous superiority as though assuming the office of a judge so that you will not be judged unfairly. See, this is the, 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 the law of sowing and reaping. Galatians 6, as we sow to the flesh, we will reap corruption. If we are judging, we will be judged. The scripture goes on. For just as you hypocritically judge others when you are sinful and unrepentant, so will you be judged in accordance with your standard of measure used to pass out judgment. Judgment will be measured to you and that's why it's so vital when we're working with people that are that are stuck in unbelief that this area of of being hurt by people and then sitting in judgment and of course if you are judging you are not fulfilling the law of christ Dealing with unforgiveness, resentments, and judgments are fundamental to the renewing of the mind to believe. And when I was preparing this yesterday, I was actually surprised at what the Holy Spirit revealed to me. And I was saying to myself, why? Because when they forgive and release the people, they are moving into faith in believing the Father to look after them. Isn't that exciting? So the moment we can take somebody who's got an unbelieving heart, struggling with the scripts of the past, the hurts, and we lead them through this place of forgiveness, they have to be trusting in God and that's starting to walk in faith that is renewing the mind we cannot have a renewed mind if we are holding on to unforgiveness resentments and judgments that's quite a statement this ministry does not happen with a short prayer in the healing line sorry this is a a walk it requires getting alongside someone, listening to their story, and yeah, check your own heart when you're ministering to people without judgment, without expectation. Oh, it's so easy to, but you should know. But, but, no. Listen to this story. And what we've got to do is suggest a course of action.
We don't tell people what to do. We suggest they need to make the decision. As Jesus says, they need to take up their cross. We cannot take up their cross for them. When we're healing somebody with disease or a broken leg or that, that's different. But when it comes to this area of the portal of the mind, they need to pray, not be prayed for. And this is uh, often a problem that you will find with people coming to the healing line in a congregation. Oh, they just have a prayer. Oh, they feel good. They go away. And then Monday, they're doing the same thing. Be with them as they choose to pray to the Father. Because it says in Matthew 18, 90, again, I say to you, that if two believers on earth agree, so when they're praying, you are in agreement, that is, are in one mind and in harmony about anything they ask, the forgiveness, the releasing, whatever it is, within the will of God, it will be done for them by the Father in heaven. Hallelujah. In the renewing of the mind, the person who has to have their mind renewed is the person who should be praying. We should continue to support them to persevere until they are transformed. The renewing of the mind, I have seldom noticed, happens in a very, very short while. It takes time. It's a walk. It's a transformation. We have been commanded to make disciples, not just converts. And the discipleship uh, route is establish, equip, empower, engage. That's the discipleship story. Most people just like to see souls saved, but what about the equipping? And Matthew 28, 19 and 20a says, therefore go and make disciples, disciples, not converts, of all the nations, help them to learn of me, believe in me and obey my words, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And when you look at that, this whole thing of discipleship, it's a walk. And that is why home groups, or whatever you want to call them, is so important. Bringing people into that with fellow believers, where there's no judgment, where they can share their struggles and people will stand with them, walk with them until they reach maturity. That doesn't generally happen on a Sunday in that 90 minutes of three songs, uh, the notices and a message. Another area where people can be transformed in their mind is through the revelation of the Father's goodness. When we can experience his goodness, it helps us to be transformed in the mind. But there is always this. But if this is not accompanied with the intervention of prayer, confession, forgiveness, cancelling the debt and repentance, they will most likely return to the old behavior patterns. You see, you can have a transformation. But if you're still holding unforgiveness, we'll have resentments. You're not free. Or well, they're not free. The thing spoken in the true proverb has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and a sow is washed only to wallow again in the mire. And that is 2 Peter 2 verses 22. See, the renewing of the mind is a transformation of the inner being. 
The mind is influenced by what it believes. There's a word missing there. What it believes is true. This is described as seeing something through a lens. And I love this little illustration of red sunglasses or red glasses. So when we're working with the people, just imagine this. So you have red glasses. You're looking through these red lenses and I'm holding up a white piece of paper. What color do they see? Because of the light going through the red glasses, they see the paper as red. And that is true. But the truth is that the paper is white. So we can have something that is true. In other words, what I see and believe. And the truth, which is something which is perverted. Now, if you are working with somebody whose eyes have automatically turned everything white with a red tinge, and then you tell them, no, it's not that, it's white. They are going to oppose you. They're going to fight you because they know what they're seeing. What they're seeing is true, but the truth, it is white. And so this is part of the struggle and where we need a lot of the help of the Holy Spirit, a word of wisdom, a word of understanding on how to lift those red glasses, to lift those red lenses so that they can see the truth. So the question sometimes is, so what do you do if someone is totally resistant to a new way of thinking? And let us go back to Jesus' times, the Pharisees. They were totally resistant to what Jesus was bringing. And you can imagine or remember what he did with them. But may I suggest that we adopt this, what Jesus did. Look at him, looking at him, Jesus felt a love, a high regard, a compassion for him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go and sell your property and give the money to the poor and you will have abundant treasure in heaven. And come, follow me, becoming my disciple, believing and trusting in me, walking in the same path of life that I walk. But the man was saddened at Jesus' words and he left grieving because he owed much property, had many possessions, which he treasured more than his relationship with God. And this is the rich young ruler that we're talking about. But I love the opening words. Jesus, looking at him, felt a love. And when people cannot understand the truth that you're trying to bring to them because of the lens that they wear in, let us just look at them in love. And release them for the Holy Spirit to do what only he can do. For me, the bottom line is that just praying for someone does not necessarily renew their mind. It will seldom take away their fear or anxiety or their lack of self-worth or their self-condemnation. Therefore, we need to be more strategic in our ministry with them than just pray. Here are some of the struggles that we need to help people overcome. And it's based on the battlefield of the mind. Just looking at a couple of chapters. And this is some of the things that um, Joyce Meyer sort of hinted at or, or shared it. I've just changed the words. My past determines who I am, I cannot change. That's a lie. We can all change. 
I want it to be easy because Jesus said his yoke is light. Sorry, the battlefield of the mind is a battle. It takes perseverance. It takes effort. Change in the way our minds think is not easy. Impatient. I want it now. We live in an instant society. We have everything is instant. Instant. The young people, everything they want, they want it now. Nobody is prepared to wait and work for it. Oh, it's not my fault. Blame the devil. Blame the pastor. Blame the church. Blame whoever. Blame the parents. Blame my spouse. We got to take responsibility for our feelings. Self-pity. It is just too difficult and so hard. Oh, I can't do it. I do not deserve it. I'm a miserable sinner. I, I don't, I'm not going to share anything more on that. Nobody has it as bad as me. Oh, my heavens. I've heard that a number of times. And then I hear the next one. Oh, other people have had it with. Therefore, I should not complain or want something better. Oh, these are lies from the pit of hell. I must do it my way without God's help. We cannot do it without God's help. We have to make the choice, but we have to do it with his help. If we can go to God and say to God one day, see, I overcome because I did. That's pride. Old Testament says he will not share his glory with another. When working with people caught up in the above min minister, uh, miseries, be careful you are not recruited into their story. Now, remember, they're struggling. They're struggling with self-pity. And they're very quick. They want to recruit you into some of this stuff. And you have to stand on the outs. You need to feel with them. It's called empathy, but not become a part of their problem. There's a thing which we call the drama triangle. And it looks something like that. So they come to you, they want some help. Oh, I'm so, this is happening to me. I'm so bad. They are a victim. And what they might be doing is trying to pull you into being their rescuer. And of course, as you come in to start helping them and you tell them uh, they need to grow up and take responsibility, they then make you the persecutor. Don't get caught up in this. You need to look after yourself. Let us look at Galatians 6 verse 1. Brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught up in any sin, you who are spiritual, that is, you who are responsive to the guidance of the Holy Spirit, i.e., we have the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. We use that, are to restore such a person in a spirit of gentleness, not with a sense of superiority or self-righteousness, keeping a watchful eye on yourself so that you are not tempted as well. That's where we can get drawn into the triangle. Oh, I've got to rescue them. I've got to save them. No, 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 no. We come alongside and walk with them. We can't do the walk for them. In verse 2, it continues. Carry one another's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the requirements of the law of Christ. That is the law of Christian love. Now, what does it mean 
to carry one another's burdens. It doesn't mean taking away their burdens, but it has this connotation of walking alongside. Yes, this is difficult, but this is the way you have to go. You have to make the choice. You have to do that. I will walk with you. And there is another part that people forget when we uh, when they look at that and, and think, oh, we must carry people's burdens and get it all wrong. Because in verse five, it states, for everyone will have to bear with patience his own burden of faults and shortcomings for which he alone, he or she alone is responsible. We don't take people's responsibility away when we are ministering in the renewal of the mind. The kingdom of God is free, but it does not come cheap. We need to be determined to work at it until the Father, until what the Father created us to be, is achieved. But it begins with us making a mind choice. In closing, Jesus called a little child to himself and set him in the middle of them and said, Most certainly I tell you, unless you turn and become as a little child, you will no way enter into the kingdom of heaven. And here when I'm talking about the kingdom of heaven, I'm not talking about salvation. Romans says the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. Therefore, whoever therefore humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. We have to humble ourselves when we Look at our faults, or people have to help humble themselves when they help them to see their faults, own them, and realize they need the Lord's help, but they have to own them. And that is from Matthew 18, 2 to 4 in the Passion Translation. So I have some questions. Have you been trying to fix people? Have you become part of their problem? Father, I just thank you for your leading and guiding. I just thank you for your Holy Spirit who is with us. I just thank you, Father, for the gifts that you've been put in each one of us to be ministers of the gospel, to come alongside others, to help them become everything you created them to be. So Father, everyone who's listening, I pray that you will anoint them and help them in their part, the way they can fulfill this to help your people be blessed. So Father, I pray a blessing on everyone listening. Father, you bless them, you keep them, you be gracious to them. Make your face to shine upon them and give them shalom which means nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken. In Jesus' name, thank you for listening. Amen.